bless everyone that helped us. Please come to the choir this time. Everyone that helped us sing, please come. Let's fill up the choir this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service. We're certainly glad you're here this morning. We've got a special service today. We're excited to hear Brother uh, Logan here in a few minutes. Anyway, uh, let's turn to page number 345. It'll be on the screen, but if everyone likes to follow along, that's, that's fine. Let's just all stand and sing the first song, Blessed Assurance. Everyone stand.
be seated. What a wonderful story. We sing about that. We rejoice in it. And if we really mean business with the Lord, not only will we praise him with our voice, we'll praise him with our life, our living, our testimony, and everything. And we sure have a lot to praise him for. If we just saw the slides in the presentation, uh, the world countries uh, other than here, uh, we owe him so much for how good he has been to us in America. And we pray, praise him for salvation, but we praise him for the freedom and everything he's given us. So let's pray to, this morning and for all those that's heard and we have special prayer requests. Many of them, we'll mention those a bit later on. But right now, Brother Jerry Lauder is going to come pray with us and for us as we lift up her heart to the Lord and thank in thankfulness and praise and honor to Jesus, the hope of the world. I'll show you. Most kind and gracious, precious Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we want to stop and, and praise your precious and holy name, Lord, for allowing us the health and the ability to come to your house this morning, dear Lord. We know of so many, dear God, that for whatever reasons are not able to be here this morning, but would dearly love to be. I pray, dear God, that we would always be thankful for that blessing. I pray that you would be in the message, in the meeting this morning, dear Lord, and that your perfect will would be done in all things that are said and done. In thy precious and holy name, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Back this up, sir.
passing the place again that will be for our special uh, guest if you missed the first service this morning wow we didn't tape it or record it there's so many sensitive things on there we get a lot of people in trouble so uh, we did enjoy it it's amazing what God's doing and God's using this dear man let's pray brother Joe pray with us Precious Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be in your house today, Lord. We know there's not an accident that we're here this morning, Lord. We just ask you to continue to be with us and bless this congregation, bless this offering we're about to receive, and may it be a blessing to your kingdom in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Man, such a beautiful job done by our, by our youth choir. Appreciate them so much. All that's going on in the world today, he's still on the throne. It's not moved at all. So glad to have Miss Anna Lee Davis going to sing with us this morning. So her and who's, whoever's going to help her, you need to come right up. For that beautiful, beautiful song, we're just thinking what a wonderful thing it was as a 12 year old boy when Jesus passed by my way. And all I did was submit my life to Him and ask for forgiveness. And that's why He came. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked the Lord to save you, to forgive you of your sins, He is near, He's passing by your way. Maybe for the final time. Brother Mark Logan's going to come speak to us and preach to us. We're so blessed to have him. World uh, traveler and he's used for God. That's what you can say in a mighty way. And he's usable and God uses usable people and anoints them too. Brother Mark, come. You mind the Lord. Don't look at your watch. We're on his time this morning. That's good to be back. It sure is. Good to see you again. I believe you were... Uh, ill the last time I was here, actually, and I'm glad to see you back in the pulpit and doing well again. And uh, good to see so many familiar faces. 
I know that, uh, uh, that uh, several of you pray diligently for me. Uh, I know it was a good friend. Uh, my, my good friend Charles Henderson is always here, but I think he's been laid, laid up recently. And, and uh, of course, Mary is taking that Sunday school class. I've been coming there for many years. But I'm so glad just to be able to see all of you familiar uh, folks uh, and, and to know that you're praying for missions, and especially for some of the places uh, that God has laid on my heart to go. It's been a joy to uh, go to restricted access countries. And when I, what I mean by that is missionaries can't go and take their families and live. And I started doing that uh, 20 years ago, and God has allowed uh, me to be a part of planting uh, scores of churches in, in countries like India and Pakistan and Bhutan and, and um, uh, Malawi, Africa, uh, India, places like that. And um, also able to go to Cuba and, and Haiti. And uh, it's just been a real joy to be in some of these troubled areas and to help the nationals be able to uh, sustain uh, and plant and sustain good, strong Bible believing churches. And I always like to come back here and, and be a part of your service. Uh, it's, it's a great honor and a great privilege. Thank you for all you do to help me uh, to get to all these places. Now, if you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 2, we're not going to stay. In that passage, very long, but we're going to open up there. Uh, the Apostle Paul writing uh, to the church he planted, Thessalonica. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I love these chapters and do a lot of teaching in Bible colleges that I've had the privilege of starting and around the world and, and uh, training young men and women to go out and serve God. It's always a joy to see them uh, involved in church planting and other forms of missions as well. It's, it's great. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, let's start at verse 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. For this cause also we thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Heavenly Father, for these few moments, I ask that you'd fill my uh, heart with your Spirit of God and just allow me to be able to uh, preach your word so that uh, people would be challenged and blessed. Uh, this morning already we've been blessed by the wonderful singing. And, and Lord, we just uh, ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 12 is, is the key verse of that little passage. Uh, and then we'll come back at the end of the message to a little later on in 1 Thessalonians 2. But verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now go back to Exodus chapter 31. We're going to be going through the book of Exodus quite a uh, not Yeah, pretty much the last part of the book this morning. And uh, there's a real lesson about uh, God calling people. You know, sometimes we think God only calls preachers. I, I mean, I think we all have, have figured that. That, that's probably been in our thinking. And I think some of us realize that no, uh, God's calling saints to do certain things, and we're all not preachers. And uh, we certainly see some of the abilities um, manifested this morning in music and, and, and testimony and all these kind of things that, are, uh, that God has called us to do. So I want to talk about walking worthy of God's calling. And we saw that that's God's plan for every believer. And God's plan to walk worthy of His calling doesn't mean calling to preach. That's wonderful if God were to call somebody to preach. But I think in a, in a, in a large group of people like this, we only might be talking about a very few who have been called to preach. But there's a lot of things God is calling believers to do. And uh, here's a good example here in the Old Testament. Um, chapter 31, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, <clears throat> See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. This man was called of God, <laughs> and filled with the Spirit of God, not to preach. He didn't preach a sermon. He didn't teach a Sunday school class. He was called and filled with wisdom to accomplish a task for God. And I think you can all kind of relate to that. 
If you have been saved, you ought to be looking for ways to serve. And I know many of you have been serving for years in this church. And you will be filled with the Spirit of God, especially in the New Testament age, when we're all at the point of salvation, indwelt by the Spirit of God. Back in those days, they weren't. The Spirit of God would come upon someone for a task, as it is in this case. But we have no excuse, because when we trust Christ as our Savior, uh, He indwells us, and He seals us permanently until what? The day of redemption. First, or that Ephesians 1, I love those verses 13 and 14. So here is a man named um, Bezalel, and he is called and filled with the Spirit of God for a task. Verse 6, And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom. So not only these two men, but he had a host of people who were also filled, who he called wise-hearted, that the Spirit of God had given wisdom for this task that they may make all that I've commanded thee, and here's the task, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table, and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burning, uh, burnt offering with all, of his, all his furniture, and the labor, and his foot, and the cloths of service, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, they shall do. That's quite a task. And later on, we'll see this in chapter 35 and other places, a lot of women were involved. And while it doesn't say that they were filled with the Spirit of God for the task, uh, we're definitely assuming by what we are told that God placed wisdom in the hearts of all the women who served under these two men. We have here an architect and a crew chief. Basically, that's... And their assignment was to build the tabernacle, which was a tent of meeting where God could come down and worship with His people. Wow! Here they were, just delivered from Egypt's bondage, and God wanted to dwell with His people. He hadn't been able to up till now, but he wanted a place where his glory could be seen. Oh, it was seen at the burning bush, and there been were other instances in Genesis, but he wanted a place where he could regularly meet with his people. And he gifted with wisdom and ability and the Spirit of God, a, an architect, a crew chief, and a bunch of people that he called. And I think today in this New Testament church, we ought to look for what God has asked us and called us and filled us and given us wisdom to do. Every saint of God within their local church ought to be saying, God, what have you called me to do here? I know what God's called me to do. I pastored for 13 years up in Canada. Before that was a youth pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina for about 13 years, oddly enough, 13, 13. And now I've been 20 years doing uh, the work that God has called me to do around the world. And I'm, no, I'm not a special person. We just need to realize what has God called me to do and gifted me to do. And we all have gifts. And these men's gifts were amazing things I wish I could do. I can't pound a nail very, very well <laughs> without, you know, making those dents all around it because I missed it. You know, but there are people who have been gifted. And when they use their gifts and calling to benefit the church of Jesus Christ, the local church and the work of God around the world in missions, that's exactly what makes God smile and be pleased. Well, in chapters 25 to 30, and again, that's too much reading for anybody. But, you know, what God is doing is meeting with Moses and Joshua up on the mountain. And, I mean, just take a quick kind of a glimpse at those chapters, and you, you will probably, in your devotion, skip them. You know, because there's just a lot of details. You shouldn't, I shouldn't, but quite honestly... You know, it's just this and that and the other. And, and God is saying to, to uh, uh, Moses now, here's, here's what I want you to do, and here's how I want you to do it, and here's what the skins are supposed to look like, here's what the uh, 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 instruments of the tabernacle are supposed to look like. They're all got to be overlaid with gold. The table, the incense, uh, all the, the boards, all the curtains. I mean, I get tired reading it. Now, can you imagine Moses up there in the mountain? He does not have a tablet. He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't, to my knowledge, even have a notebook. And God is going on and on and on about what he's supposed to do. Imagine if you were Moses. I'm, you're a bit skilled. You're a leader. 
but you don't know how to build these things. And your mind wouldn't even be able to absorb all these things. When he came down from the mountain, all he had was Ten Commandments. I don't know of anything else. I don't think he had a pocketbook of things that he was writing down furiously as God was, writing, or was dictating to him. He had a mind, and he had the Spirit of God. But I can imagine Moses is thinking, God, I'll never be able to do this. I don't even remember what you're telling me. How am I going to accomplish this? That's what I'd be thinking. How about you? And so he came down from that mountain with two tablets, pretty bewildered, because he didn't know that God had already called somebody to do exactly what he couldn't fathom doing. His name was Bezalel, and his partner was Aholiab. And there were many, many people that God called from the congregation to help him do it. Pastor, can you relate to that? You think, how can I pastor this church? And you've been doing it for, I don't know how many, 30, 40, 50 years. I, I don't know. But I thank God for your long-time ministry. But you know, you didn't do it alone. Amen? Because God called people all along the way. I'm glad I see familiar people. I go to churches and sometimes I don't recognize the whole staff turned over. I'm thankful for these guys that have been here for many years. And, but, you know, that's what the Bezaleels and the Holy Abs do. And so as Moses came down from the mountain, I'm sure his head was swimming, and he had no idea that God already had called out these two guys and everybody else to help him. So he comes down from the mountain. And, uh, <clears throat> and let's go to, uh, to uh, chapter 32. Some people that God calls don't obey real well. Because somebody else that was called to be a part of this was Aaron. Only chapter 32 is a, can I say the word, damning report on Aaron's stewardship. Aaron was also called. Moses was called, but so was Aaron. Look what Aaron did. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that has brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings <coughs> which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Oh, my goodness. And when it, imagine saying that publicly, that these things that they had thrown together, idol, idols, were the gods that brought them out of the land of Egypt. And furthermore, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So here's this golden calf, and yet it was a feast to the Lord, Jehovah. This man was really messing up big time. And as Moses came down from the mountain, God said to Moses, verse 9, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Oh my, God was ready to destroy them. It was so bad. Well, what was so bad about it? Obviously, the, the, they needed, the, the people needed something more visual. Can we relate to that? You know any churches where it's got to be more visual? How about more pleasurable? Because they were having a big time down here worshiping Jehovah. They were casting off their clothes. More sensual. More loud. Let's, let's look at verse 17. And when Joshua, they heard they're coming down the mountain. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. He thought maybe they were being attacked by the Amalekites or somebody. And he said... It, uh, it, is a no, it is not the noise of them that shout for mastery. He's, he's trying to discern it. He's coming down and it's getting noisier and clearer. Neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Let me ask you a question. Do you know of songs that sound like war? Anybody ever heard songs like that? Unfortunately, there are churches today that think that is God honoring worship. And it's nothing but noise. It's the sounds like war, and yet it's the sounds of singing. I don't think it takes a genius for you to know what I'm talking about. Right now, there's churches all over the city and all over America, and they're jamming. 
and they're so noisy you can't think. I'm so glad when I come here, Pastor. We sing not only good Bible sound doctrine songs, but in a God-honoring way. And I'm going to say that I always, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a broad scope. I, I enjoy some, some Southern gospel. I, you know, I enjoy other kinds of, but I don't enjoy having to want to plug my ears when I'm a guest speaker somewhere. And believe me, I've had to walk out of a few. And I'm the guest speaker. And I didn't do it from the pulpit, but I slunk out the back until they were finished the noise. And it was hard for me to preach places like that. So here comes Moses and Joshua, and they're, they're, what they see is shocking. It's casual. It ha- oh, the people said, well, we can't worship a God we don't see. Let's, let's get more visuals in our worship. And I'm afraid that's what we're seeing happen in churches today in America. You talk about America in decline, and I do think it is morally, morally and maybe some other ways. But I think the churches are in decline. The evangelical churches are in decline. And I think this is one of the main reasons. And then verse verse 25, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, now, I I don't mean nude, stark naked. I mean, whenever you see naked in the Bible, like when Peter was naked fishing, I mean, he had his underwear on, he had his cloth on. That was just the way naked was in, in, in this biblical word. All right? But still in all, if they've cast off their outer, outer, outer clothing and they're basically down to their skivvies, that is an insult to God. And I don't like to see it in the churches today. I don't know about you. When Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Casual worship. Throw off, just, just wear whatever you came in from the beach wearing and lead your worship service. No, I, I, I don't... I think there's a problem there. It's a biblical problem. I'm not making this up. Aaron was supposed to be the same as Moses, called of God to do a job, and look what he's done already. Moses has gone 40 days, and look what he's done. Golden calf, more visual, more pleasure. They're dancing, the Bible says, verse 19. It came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses... Anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And as, as, as you could see, all that gold now pounded into powder by those, you know, uh, big hammers, you know, ja- no, you know, big hammers that they would have, and then seeing all the gold pieces go down into the brook and wash down the river. That was an expensive situation, going, washing down the river. And the people then were made to drink of it. That's what God thought about this. And then Aaron made an excuse. Uh, look at verse uh, uh, 24. Aaron's trying to excuse his behavior. And I, I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it into the fire, and out came this calf. What a whopper. He's telling right here. (laughs) Out came this calf. Random. I don't like random worship. I don't like spontaneous, random, you know, out came this song. No, I, I I think we should be called to a task and do the task in God's way filled with the Spirit of God. Not just randomly throwing stuff together in the manner that we see here. This is a real lesson. That's not my message, though. It just have happened to be chapter 32 in the middle of a, a really great uh, portion of Scripture. Some that are called don't obey. Some want to please worldly people instead of pleasing God. So let's turn the page now. God's willing people brought materials. And we see that because here's the thing. They brought, had to bring a lot of gold to, spe- to, for, to meet God's demands for the tabernacle. Everything had to be covered with pure gold. And yet, here was this gold that the people brought washing down the river into powder in little pieces. And nobody was scrambling to pick it up. It was gone. So now what do I do? Moses says, I've got to build all these things and overlay them with gold. And there goes the gold. No, I don't even think he worried about it for a minute. That was God's problem. And he, I'm sure he had by now met after, after the shock of what he'd seen wore off, he had now met Bezalel and Aholiab, and they were the, going to be his designer and crew chief, and, and he had all this host of God-called people. I'm sure that encouraged his heart. 
And he went to bat for his people. He said, listen, God, don't destroy them all. It wasn't all of them. And you know what? God knew. It. It's not like we have to tell God something he doesn't know. But I'm sure God was happy to hear that Moses didn't think that it, it was everybody doing that. So they did kill a lot of people. Moses said, strap your sword on and go out and kill whoever's been involved in this. And they did that. It was a terrible time. But now they had to get to the business that God called them to do. And the next several chapters uh, tell the story of how that, uh, th they accomplished that. God's willing people brought the materials. Uh, so the next, the next few uh, chapters, but let's, uh, again, we can read them all, but we wouldn't have time. Let's go to um, chapter uh, 35. So now the, the people are bringing the, the, the things for the tabernacle. And verse 21, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all his service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. Where did they get it? Well, here's the thing. They refused Aaron. That's how they got it. There were a lot more people who said, I'm not having anything to do with that kind of worship. And it's about time that we ought to get on our, you know, stand up on our feet and oppose some of this stuff if we see it creeping in. This is what happened. They brought their gold. They brought their bracelets because they had already said, do you think Bezalel gave his gold as he was collecting it from the people? No, nope, not a chance. He wasn't letting Aaron have any of that. He was filled with the Spirit of God. So he wasn't a part of that. And so these people were bringing it all. Every man who was willing. Every woman who was willing. Now let's read on. And every man whom was, uh, with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shatim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women, I like this one, that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And we could see all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And on and on and on. And look at verse 29. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of the work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hands of Moses. And then drop down to verse 34. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach. This Speaking of, of Bezalel. He's speaking of Bezalel starting verse 30. The one who, verse 31, is, uh, he hath, God had filled him with wisdom, the Spirit of God. Now verse 34, he hath put his heart that he may teach. So not only was Bezalel called of God for a task, but he had the ability to teach others. You see, those, of, those who are called for certain tasks can't do it alone. You, you, if you were here this morning, you see that God has accomplished some things in some unlikely countries. I, I mean, I was willing to go, but you know, I couldn't do that. These people, Asher in Pakistan, Shankumi in India, um, um, Pema in, in Bhutan, a, a na, na, naz, uh, Navigator in Malawi. These are people who do the work day by day by day. All I do is show up and keep them on the same page, encourage them and support them with funds. It, see, it, you have to have leadership, but you have to have God-called people who are willing for, to, to do the task. Man, we've got an army of young ladies trained in the Bible colleges too that are out there going to villages doing day, day, uh, vacation Bible, not vacation Bible school, you call it here, but you know, just, just teaching Bible lessons with flannel graphs and things like that. People are doing the work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart, work all manner of work, and of the engraver and of the cunning workmen of the embroider in blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. So, chapter 36, then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary. So, the, the understanding here is God calls and fills leaders. They teach. And God calls and fills workers to do according to the, what they have been taught. That is the 
It was the pattern then. It's still the pattern today in the gospel. We, tr- we have to train our leaders. We must have Bible colleges in these, in these places, even if the government doesn't like it. Because we just can't send just anybody, like there's a certain group of Christians who do, just they you know, give them about a week or two of a seminar, and out they go to, and they call themselves pastors. By the way, if anybody from Pakistan says they're a pastor and they want your money, yeah, come to me, please. Because I, I, I'm up to here with that. They're not pastors. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even be qualified to teach your Sunday school class. But they know how to get the money from people in America. You know what I'm talking about? Got to be trained. They got to know what they're doing. God picked people who already knew how to do stuff, and he filled them with his wisdom. And we must not cave into these emails that come flooding in from certain countries of the world. Oh, I'm a pastor. Well, they've re- read your website, and they know exactly what you believe, so they believe that. And if they get on the Pentecostals website, they believe that. And they know how to get, I, I, I've just come from Pakistan. Two different people I've sat eyeball to eyeball and exposed. Because somebody said, will you check on this person for me? There's a street I was on where almost everybody in the street was a pastor. In the sense that they could get on their internet and get money from America and call themselves a pastor. Nobody trained except for our guy who's planted the church four years, doctrinally straight. You see the difference? God didn't call just anybody. He called a man who knew what he was doing. He called Moses because he knew Moses really knew what he was doing, even though he was a very humble man. Called Aaron. Aaron didn't turn out too well. All right, let's read verse 3. And they received of Moses all the offering, which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. <laughs> not every Sunday, <laughs> not every Sabbath. Every morning they're bringing money and bringing gold and bringing materials. This is what I like because some of us may not be called for a particular teaching task or leadership task, but we can all come and, and bring in the funds in order for the job to be done. That's what you're seeing here. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work, which they made, And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough. (laughs) You'll love this, Pastor Roy. For the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And uh, Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. Pastor, when was the last time you had to make that proclamation? No more offerings. We, we, just can't, we just can't take it. That's what they did. No, don't, don't bring any more gold, please. No more of the beautiful things. We've got enough. We just keep it. Now you keep the rest of it. I don't know of another instance in the Bible or in human existence where anybody's had to do that. <laughs> but every pastor would sure love to be able to at least not have to make the proclamation, but say, why, isn't this great? And I'm sure there are pastors who have had seasons of their ministry when, wow, it's amazing. I really don't know what I'm going to do with all of it, but I'll find something that needs to be done. Hey, that's a good problem to have. And that's what they were experiencing here. It was wonderful. God was well pleased. Now, now skip ahead a few more chapters. You'll see in chapter 37, the word gold. I've underlined it. All my, my Bible is almost yellow with the times I put gold on here. You realize they brought over a million dollars of our value worth of gold? Just gold as well as all the rest of the stuff. So go through chapter 38, chapter 39, the, uh, still talking about gold on chapter, 30, chapter 39. Keep underlining gold and it'll, it'll fill your, <laughs> your, your vision will be caught to all the yellow that you've underlined or whatever color you use. And then chapter 39, verse 43. And Moses did look upon all the work and behold, they had done it. <laughs> Don't you love this? As the Lord had commanded, even so had they done it. And Moses blessed them. Oh, listen, what, what a great thing to be said about your work for God. You've done what the Lord commanded you to do. It doesn't have to compare with what Billy Graham did or, you know, some of our great heroes of the faith. I, I love Ralph Sexton Jr. I, that's where I go when I'm not traveling all around. I mean, there's some great men of, of the faith, that, but we don't have to be exactly like them. We don't have to be even touch their shoelaces, but if we'll do what God's called us to do, then we'll get this this statement, I believe, one day. And we're going to see that here in the New Testament. But before we leave Exodus, you've got to go to the last few verses of this book. We go to verse 30 of chapter 40. 
And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put the water there to wash with all. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. I'm glad for God's grace to Aaron. Oh, he messed up really bad. But he's on board now. He realized what a fool he'd been. You know, sometimes a man of God, a woman of God has to do that. Man, I was a fool. But he's right with God now. Or God wouldn't have had anything to do with him. But he had a repentant heart. What a dumb thing he did, and he owned up to it. All right, when they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court around about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. And it doesn't say, but I believe Bezalel and Aholiab and all the workers were right around. I believe they had the best view of it all. Why would I believe that? Well, you know, it makes sense. They, they did all the work. So they're right there. Right there at the dedication. Now, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And there was Bezalel and Aholiab. There were the ladies and the men who had done it all. I mean, they, their hands made those curtains. Their hands overlaid with gold, all the stuff. And the glory of God, it's there on what I made. It doesn't get any better than that. I think in heaven, so we, we might see that. But I don't think we'll ever see that on earth. But they got to see that. The glory of God. And I made those things. So now let's close by going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Same chapter... And we'll go down to verse 19. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye, that's the believers at Thessalonica, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. You know, that's when you have led a soul to Christ, or maybe 10 or 15 souls, and you get to see them raptured with you, and you see them in the crowd, their black faces, their brown faces, whatever, whatever. You know, I, I, that's my experience because I'm in those countries all the time. But you know, that's our glory and joy. It will be the people that are in heaven because of us. Maybe you've led your father to the Lord or, or sister, brother, mother-in-law. Somebody that's going to be in heaven with you. And as we go up, you'll see them and they'll know and you'll know they're there because of your witness. What a glory, what a joy. Amen? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you would use empty and vessels that you have redeemed and then you have filled with your spirit and you have allowed us to, to be called into your service, the service of winning others to Christ both here and around the world. And Lord, we're looking forward to you coming. And it will be glorious when we see you in the clouds and then we come back when you come in great glory and to rule and reign on this earth. And yes, you are on the throne, but Lord, it's not like what you had in mind, I'm sure, when you created this world. And yet you knew it would happen. And one day you're going to fix it all. And this, this, this kingdom will be glorious and we'll be a part of it. Thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity to serve you. And I pray this morning if there's somebody here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, help them to realize that time is drawing short and they, they may be left behind. Lord, I pray they, they receive Christ, the only hope of eternity. Receive that gift of eternal life. And then, Lord, thank you for these who are witnessing and you know, fulfilling your calling of teaching and, and, and working with Awana and boys and girls, Awana, all they, whatever you've called them to do. Bless them, Lord. And help us just to continue to keep our focus on you so that when you come, we might be part of your glory and receive the rewards that you have promised to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark for the message that God gave us this morning for me, for you, workers. Willing workers, would you stand? Musicians are coming, altars open. If you're here this morning, God touched your heart. You're not ready to go. 
look at the world situation, look what's happening in Israel now, and all the signs pointing to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when he comes for his bride, if you're not saved, you'll be left behind. But this morning, as he draws nigh to you, as he's speaking in your heart, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, please. You've got to put on your heart. This is your day, your timing for salvation. Would you come? You may be here this morning. The Lord's nudged your heart to be a willing worker in some task that he's been maybe already talking to you about, but you were waiting for the opportunity for another nudge. Or maybe this is the first nudge. Whatever the need is, altars open as they play as your hearts our mind, our ears are open to the words of God that he has spoken to us. This message is for us. He uses other people in the word of God, their failures and their mistakes and their will accomplishments to tell us what we need to be doing. We've heard that. We've enjoyed what God has given us this morning, but now he's speaking to us. Lord Jesus. Thank you for Mother Mark, how he's willing to go and separate himself from his family and loved ones and go to those dangerous areas and how you've kept him, how you've empowered him, how you've used him for all those people around the country that's helped and been those willing workers that's provided the needs for your work and other countries will be done. You died for the sins of the world. And I pray, Father, this morning that you'll nudge your hearts. Help us be more mindful that we're in the last days. What we do, we need to do quickly for your glory. The rewards you will give. But we're working for the cause of Christ because we love your work. We love the people. And thank you, Father, for placing that love within us. How we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for what you're doing. Keep your hand upon Brother Mark, upon his precious wife, upon his family. Thank you for using him, for sending him. And thank you for sending him to us this morning. We needed this. We needed to know what you're doing, how you're doing, and the great work you're still doing, even though we haven't been able to understand and know all that you're doing. And now we see just a a little part of it by his testimony, by his presentation that God's still working, using us, using people that's usable. We bless your name, in Jesus' name, with thanksgiving we pray. In your name, amen. The ushers are going to come now and we're going to receive the offering that all go for the work that he's been talking about, willing workers, and then we'll have a special announcement before we close. And we're going to pray over this offering. We have a lot of prayer requests. A lot of our people are hurting. A lot of people... died, a lot of injured, you know, on I-40, the terrible wreck, and you know, all for the families, for a lot of people. And let's just trust God to do all these things according to his riches and glory. Brother Gunn, if you'll come pray this prayer and pray for the offering and for all these prayer requests. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for the message. Lord, we've been challenged. Our heart's been challenged. Lord, I want to thank you for the man, Lord, that you would be with Brother Mark. Father, you'd bless his endeavors. Go before him. Keep him safe, Lord. I pray for your people. I pray for the city of God, Jerusalem. Lord, you know the need, and I pray, Lord, for your protection. Pray for this church, Lord. No other time before, like now, that we need your presence. We need your power. We need your guidance. Lord, I pray that you'd send salvation to, to the lost. Lord, those who are lost and undone on the way to hell. Lord, that you would manifest yourself to them, speak to your hearts, convict them. And Lord, let them help them call upon your name. Lord, I pray that you bless this offering. I pray, Lord, that, that everything that we say, everything that we do, Lord, as we go out and as we're called to witness, to be a light for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, it would bring honor and glory to him. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you so much for coming, all the visitors. We thankful God sent you here this morning. If you're looking for a church, we sure hope God sends you this way. Our arms are open wide. We just trust God to do for us what no one else can do. We have an announcement here. Just a few words to the seniors. If you're 50 years old, you're a senior. And we have a, a good thing for you that we would like to put before you. We, the seniors, are doing a traveling and it, it's time for we to start it again this season. It's been cold, it's been rainy, but we're getting ready to start again. The 26th of this month, beyond Friday, we will journey all the way over to Tennessee to a place called Chucky, Tennessee, where they have a great rest farmer's daughter. And they will serve you as long as you leave. And they're very inexpensive. It's $22 per person. Now, what I'd like to do and help them and us too, to lessen the time, if you would give us the money up front here, uh, I'll have myself and a couple other people in the back tonight, Wednesday night, Sunday, to take the money from you. We won't take it by gun, we just ask you to give it to us. <laughs> now, it's $22 per person, and if you go to some of the restaurants here in town, you don't even get out of town and you just pay that much. So you're going to be driving the big, big tour bus and have good friendship, good fellowship, prayer time, and all that. And I would appreciate every, everything, but again, we want the church family to have the first gift, the first go. We're going to cut it off at 50 people. Now, the sound up sheet is in the back, and uh, appreciate you signing, signing it up. We won't collect today. Well, tonight it will be available if you want to do that, to give the money. And they appreciate it over there also. Now, they're only open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so that's why we're a little bit behind the, the ball. But I appreciate your time, and I thank you very much for the situation. Thank you, my brother. We appreciate you being here this morning. Let's have a word of prayer before we dismiss. Lord, it's been good to be in your house this morning. So many needs that we pray, we lift them up to you. We trust you, Father, to do that which is pleasing to you according to your will. We love you, Jesus, and thank you for everyone that came. I pray your hearts will be in tune with your heart that we will hear and be willing to do. Thank you, Father, for the visitors. Thank you for the evangelists. Keep them in your heart and keep him surrounded by the peace, the safety. I know you're going to lead him, direct him. In Jesus' name, amen. See you tonight. God bless.